The hospital room, decked out with balloons, a happy birthday, sign, and fresh roses, felt spacious and cheery. However, Michelle, a young woman in a coma for several years, couldn't appreciate the festive atmosphere or hear the soft voice of a little girl by her side. La la la, la la la, and the evil sorceress enchanted the fairy. The fairy fell asleep, and no one knew how to break the spell. The medical machines beeped indifferently, maintaining Michelle's dwindling life. Equally indifferent was the man standing nearby. We gotta go. They're pulling the plug in an hour, he said quietly. Kenneth, maybe we should hold off. Margaret, clad in a white coat, nervously clasped her hands, glancing from Michelle to Kenneth. You're back at it, Margaret. We agreed to do this after her birthday. What's the holdup? I read about this guy who woke up after five years in a coma. She persisted. Maybe there's a chance. Sweetheart, there's no chance her brain's still ticking, Kenneth replied. Even if she wakes up, she might be a vegetable for life. You know her. Would she want that? It's tough for me too. Michelle's my wife. She's Angela's mom, he added glancing at their daughter, who clutched a fairy doll. After a pause, he shook his head. But I don't want to keep torturing her, or us. Daddy, Daddy, little Angela looked up. Are we gonna see the fairy tomorrow? No, Angela, we're not, he said. Angela placed the doll on Michelle's bed, humming softly. Then she hurried to Margaret, heading for the exit. Mom, what about the day after tomorrow? She asked. Margaret didn't answer. She just took Angela's hand and left. Kenneth lingered by Michelle's bed a moment longer, then grabbed a bouquet of roses, tore down the sign, and wrapped the flowers in it. He'd done all he could, but hope has its limits too. Ignoring everyone, Kenneth worked down the hospital corridor past a janitor scolding a young intern. Young fool, smoking in the utility room. You trying to start a fire? Jason, the janitor, didn't respond. Jason watched as Kenneth tossed the roses and followed him. Through the blinds, he saw Kenneth slip an envelope of cash to a doctor, who quickly counted it. They shook hands, and Kenneth left. Jason caught up on the stairs. Don't do it. I can fix her. Not now, old man, Kenneth said, shaking him off. Give me a year, and I'll get her back, Jason yelled just a year. Meanwhile, Margaret struggled to help Angela with her coat, but Angela insisted on doing it herself. I got it. Fine. Do it yourself, Margaret said, then noticed Kenneth. She nudged Angela toward the door. Go on, sweetie, she said, then turned to Kenneth and handed him the coat. He's asking permission for his experiment again. She asked, crazy janitor, Kenneth replied. Won't let it go. Kenneth, maybe we should give him a chance. They say he was a good neurosurgeon. What chance? Margaret. Kenneth sighed. We've tried everything. It's over. With determined strides, he left the hospital. Margaret barely keeping up with him. Neither of them noticed the smoke billowing from the windows of the ward where Michelle, motionless and helpless, was about to be disconnected from the machines sustaining her fading life. The doctor already in Michelle's room, didn't pay attention to the emerging fire as he filled a syringe with a yellowish liquid. But when a janitor appeared behind him with a bucket and mop, he sharply turned and snapped at her. Gloria, get out. I need to clean the floors. She grumbled. Later, the doctor wasn't going to continue his task in her presence. Typical. Always later, grumbled Gloria as she left the room immediately shouting in the corridor. What's going on? Is he smoking again? Fire. What's happening? Fire. Fire. People rushed around the ward. So much smoke. Someone yelled. Get to the stairs. So much smoke. The doctor quickly glanced at the door, then turned to Michelle and slowly injected the medicine into her fortube, mixing it with the solution already flowing into her bloodstream. Then he hastily left the room, and on the monitor tracking Michelle's heart, the endless green line replaced the steady zigzags. Taking advantage of the chaos, 
Jason slipped into Michelle's room and understood instantly. With great effort, he managed to restart her heart, exhaling only when the green line, flickering, returned to its rhythmic zigzags. Several days passed. Gloomy Kenneth stood by the open grave where his wife's coffin was about to be lowered. Margaret, clutching crimson roses, didn't raise her eyes and silently listened to the priest's drawn-out voice saying a prayer. Five years in a coma, only to perish in a fire, shook her head the not-so-young, but still beautiful woman with a lace black shawl over her hair. Mon Dieu, my God, my poor girl. They slowly lowered the coffin into the grave, and Kenneth, bending down, threw the first handful of soil onto it. Young one, the priest spoke, sorrowfully folding his hands, and no one came to see her off. Michelle had no one else besides us, Margaret quietly told the priest standing next to her. Everyone else is in St. Petersburg. It's a shame. He shook his head. They could have come. May her soul rest in peace. I only had Michelle as a niece, sighed the late Saint again, looking at Kenneth. And now she's gone. We dreamed of showing Angela Paris with Michelle. And now you'll have to do it. Come visit me. All right. Just without her. Donna gestured towards Margaret. Don't start. Please. Kenneth pleaded wearily. Or maybe we could go to them. Remember Michelle. Margaret suggested. I can't. I have a flight at two. Donna replied with a stone face. I need to make it to court for the divorce. You're getting divorced again. Margaret was surprised. Why not? Want to snatch my French husband away? Donna sniped. Too late, sweetheart. He's practically nobody to me now. Kenneth. Margaret's voice trembled with tears. Ignore her. He said quietly, watching Donna work away. Michelle's family is a bit peculiar. They stood there for a little longer, then left without noticing Jason, who stood a little apart, hiding his face with his hood. He didn't linger at the cemetery either, and soon was approaching a small old house, fenced with a low picket fence. In the yard, right by the porch, sat a ten-year-old girl, clutching her little brother, Melissa. Jason called her with an annoyed voice, climbing over fences again. Knocked, no answer, means no one's home. Why climb, Jason? Mom will scold me. The girl said almost in tears, showing the old man her brother's hands. The index and middle fingers of the crying child were stuck in rings, and there was no way for the children to get them out themselves. Jason let the kids into the house and, taking a tool from the cabinet, began carefully sawing the first ring. She'll give it to me, sighed the girl, and she'd be right to, nodded Jason. You'll learn not to leave your brother unattended, silly girl. But I was only gone for a minute. Melissa defended herself. Go on. Don't get in the way. Jason scolded her. She hurriedly moved to the wall and began to read aloud the certificate hanging there for achievements in the study of the human brain. Here, Jason handed her the sawn rings. Maybe we can glue them somehow. With modeling clay, maybe. Melissa pondered. But hearing an unfamiliar squeak from the neighboring room, she nodded her head in that direction. What do you have there? Take him. Jason handed her the little brother and gently nudged him towards the door. Go on, go. The girl took a few steps towards the exit. But as soon as Jason disappeared into the strange room, she returned and, seating her brother on a chair, pressed herself to the crack of the slightly ajar door. Melissa managed to see the woman lying on the high bed, over whom Jason leaned. He put some kind of mask on her face, but upon hearing the noise, he came out to the girl. What now? He asked sternly. I forgot to say thank you. Melissa quickly came up with an answer. Thank you. She hastily left her neighbor's house, and he returned to his patient in the room, which resembled more of an intensive care unit. Jason himself also changed into a surgeon's outfit and didn't forget his cap, gloves, and mask. He drew the required medicine into a syringe and listened with surprise to the message on the radio. In our city, in the intensive care unit of clinical hospital number 12, as we reported earlier, a fire broke out three days ago. 
and only today it became known that the fire did not go without casualties. One person died. A 30-year-old woman who had been in a coma for five years. The name of the deceased is not disclosed. The hospital management insists it was an accident. The fire occurred in a utility room. An investigation is ongoing. And now for some good news. Jason administered the injection to his patient and looked at the beeping machine on the monitor of which the green zigzags began to move slightly faster. Oh, so you can hear everything. Jason smiled contentedly, but Michelle didn't respond. She continued to lie motionless, unaware that at that moment her little daughter was running towards Margaret, shouting to her with a voice ringing with joy, Mom, I know how to break the fairy spell. The girl handed Margaret a book. She instantly responded, My darling. But Angela continued to recount what she had just read. A girl was allowed to look into the magic mirror. She saw herself, remembered everything, and woke up. Mom, let's go to the hospital. My sunshine, we will definitely go. Margaret leaned over Angela. Just not today. Okay, tomorrow. For sure. She persisted. Ah, okay. Then I'll look for the magic mirror. Angela agreed. But you promised. Kenneth smiled at his daughter and watched her for a moment. Then turned to Margaret and said in an irritated tone, She's six years old. She believes in all sorts of nonsense. Thank you, dear. What else will you teach her? I told her about this when she was two. Margaret tried to justify herself. How could I know she would remember? Fine. Kenneth nodded and repeated. Fine. But now tell her the truth. It's time to come back to reality. Or I'll do it myself. The door to the office slammed loudly. And Margaret clasped her hands as if she suddenly felt very cold. How unfair Kenneth was. Was she really the only one to blame? And was there even any fault of hers in what happened? The white Labrador. Sticking out his tomb quickly descended from the second floor, followed by Angela. Tucker, Tucker, the girl called her beloved pet. Angela won't believe us. Margaret sighed. She's just like Michelle. And Michelle always had her own truth about everything. Suddenly, she remembered the day when Michelle, picking up a white puppy and tying a blue ribbon around its neck, began to pose for Margaret's camera. Michelle, have you gone mad? Don't you have enough trouble besides a puppy? Margaret smiled. But this isn't for me. Michelle replied cheerfully. They asked me to make a short film about an ordinary person's ordinary day at college. Margaret tried to reason with her friend. Well, this is my ordinary day. Michelle laughed. Margaret had no choice but to continue filming. But for some reason, I'm helping her with this. She said, pointing the camera at herself. I don't know why but I'm helping. So, she decided to make a little boy happy. The one who was crying so hard on the street and really wanted a puppy, but he was crying so much. He begged. Michelle said in a plaintive tone. Of course, Michelle, Margaret didn't share her optimistic friend's sentiment. So now, are we going to buy puppies for all the crying boys in town? They both stood in the entrance of an unfamiliar apartment where the boy who dreamed of having a dog lived. Having overheard his wish by chance, Michelle bought a little white Labrador and decided to give the child a secret gift. She put the puppy on the doormat and adjusted the bow. You promised to be his good friend, she said to him. Okay, deal, shake on it. Well, knock, Margaret said. But before the door opened, she managed to slip a business card under the puppy. Margaret, Michelle hurried her and they both quickly descended to the lower floor. Margaret cautiously peeked into the stairwell and saw the little boy joyfully petting the puppy. But then his mother's loud disapproving voice was heard. Who's there? Who did you open the door for? I've told you a hundred times. Five minutes later, Michelle was once again holding the unhappy child close, looking at Margaret with a disappointed expression. While Margaret filmed her again, it's a good thing we left the card. Margaret said. Otherwise, your Labrador would have to live on the street. Did she really say? Either take it or I'll throw it out on the street. 
Michelle couldn't believe her ears. Something like that. But in other words, Margaret chuckled. You wouldn't have liked it. So, are we returning it to the store? Michelle shook her head. I'll keep him with me. With you. Margaret was surprised. And what will Dad say? Dad and I will figure it out. Michelle stroked the puppy and hugged him again. Right, we'll figure it out. Oh, you're such a good boy. Interrupting her thoughts, Margaret was startled by Angela's loud cry. Mom, you broke the magic mirror. Margaret herself didn't understand how it happened and quickly sat down next to the girl. My dear, are you hurt? No, Angela was on the verge of tears. Well, are you done playing with your mirror? Kenneth worked past trying not to step on the shards, while Margaret, ignoring him, tried to calm Angela. Well, do magic mirrors break? It wasn't even a magic one. Here, Kenneth written with a brush and dustpan. This is magical. The real deal. Margaret handed the girl a round mirror in a silver case and smiled at her. Then she cleaned up the shattered pieces on the floor and started preparing dinner, mentally persuading herself to calm down. After all, these unpleasant days must eventually come to an end, and peace and happiness would finally come to their family. But Jason's curious neighbor, Melissa, couldn't shake off her visit to his house. As soon as it got dark outside, she gathered her friends around the campfire and, adding a mysterious tone to her voice, began to tell them what she had seen in the mysterious room. A helmet and wires sticking out everywhere. And then he took this needle. The girl spread her hands, showing a distance of at least 20 centimeters, and started sewing something with it. What? One of her listeners trembled. A head. The girl declared in a tone that brooked no objections. And she added, emphasizing each word. Jason creates monsters. Melissa chuckled the boy sitting next to her. There's no such thing as monsters. I saw it myself. She looked at him disdainfully. Let's tell our parents. Another boy said, stuttering slightly out of excitement and fear. No, she waved him official, we'll handle it ourselves. Interesting, laughed the boy who had just doubted her. And how, create our own monster? No, we'll steal it from Jason, Melissa stated firmly. Meanwhile, Jason stood in the laboratory headed by his son Larry watching as he took vials filled with a pinkish substance from a portable refrigerator and then placed them in a container his father had brought with him. The deputy director started asking questions. Larry whispered quietly, you know, his father tried to reassure him. If anything, I hacked into the lab and stole the vials. Besides, how could he know how much of this donor material you've used for experiments? Don't worry, I'm not worried, dad. I'm not worried, just. Larry finished with the vials and took out a bottle of vodka and a jar of fish preserves from another refrigerator. No, I'm on duty. Jason waved it official. No, dad, come on. Larry didn't accept his father's objection. Did I chill this for nothing? Besides, we have a reason. Mia got her diploma on Friday. He picked up a framed photograph from the table and looked at his college graduate daughter. Why wasn't I invited? Jason also scrutinized his granddaughter's face. Well, she, Larry became embarrassed. She didn't invite anyone. Mia, Jason gently stroked the girl's portrait. How she's grown up. She used to visit us. And now, Larry quickly changed the subject. Tell me, do you really believe we can restore brain activity after five years? Yes. Absolutely, Jason said confidently. Okay, let's say she wakes up. Larry paused, then decided to ask the question that was particularly bothering him. How will you explain the experiments on the abducted coma patient? I understand, of course, that you want to prove to them all that you were right then. But I don't want to prove anything. His father interrupted him. I just want to finish what I started. That's all. Can't you understand that? You'll be jailed. Larry said confidently. For what? Exclaimed Jason. For saving a person they wanted to kill. For stealing. His son corrected him. No. Jason protested. 
But Larry stood his ground. Yes. You stole. You substituted someone else for Michelle's body. You conducted illegal experiments. And the fire. Do you realize what could have happened? Jason remembered how he himself had set that recent fire in the hospital and spoke excitedly. The left wing burned down. There was nobody there except Michelle. Okay. But if Larry wanted to say so much, but his father didn't let him gather his thoughts. What? I've thought of everything. If it works out, imagine how many lives I can save. Dad. 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 Larry immediately softened and began pouring vodka into glasses. You're all about people. People. Shall we drink to you? Jason sighed, looking into his son's eyes. But instead of condemnation, he read only boundless respect and the familiar love of a son. Late in the evening, when Angela had already gone to bed, Margaret went to her room and turned on an old video she had made herself. Then she took out an album of photographs and began to look through them, pouring herself a glass of brandy, which helped her cope with the cunning pain. Though she was on the TV screen with Michelle blowing out candles on a cake, there they were hugging and laughing, and here they were together again, only in a photo. The door opened, and Angela in her pajamas with her hair down walked barefoot to Margaret, but stopped upon seeing the glass in her hands. Mom, why aren't you sleeping? Are you drinking your medicine again? Ew, it's so bitter. How can you? Sweetheart, Margaret didn't want to talk to her right now. Go to sleep. I'll be there in a minute. Go on, go. The girl sighed and left, and Margaret finished her brandy and looked at the screen. She remembered this evening well. They were relaxing at a cafe with Michelle, and she, fooling around, messed up her hair. You're always messing around. Margaret said to her friend, and your dad, by the way, worries about you. Stop scratching me. She laughed, pushing her friend away and pointing the camera at her, filming everything. Dad worries about you. What does he have to worry about? Michelle shrugged. I don't want to do business, and certainly not construction. I don't want to deal with bricks. She added jokingly. Then what do you want to do? For heaven's sake. Margaret's voice off screen sounded surprised and mocking. I don't know. That's the point. Michelle shrugged. I don't know what I want to do. I want to help people. Michelle smiled and crossed her fingers. She didn't immediately notice the handsome young man who approached them with pastries in his hands and sat down next to them, helping. Oh, how interesting. He said, rudely interrupting not only the conversation between the friends, but also Margaret's video recording. Yes, please tell me, can you help me? I have a bad heart. When I saw you, it just stopped beating. He reached out to Michelle. Kenneth, Michelle, she shook his hand. Pleasure to meet you. Kenneth held her hand a little longer than necessary. Likewise, Michelle blushed and suddenly, as if just remembering her friend sitting across from her, said, this is Margaret. Margaret, hi. Kenneth waved to the camera. The recording ended, and a gray fuzz appeared on the screen. Margaret picked up the photos and started sorting through them, examining the happy faces of Michelle, Kenneth, and herself. Back then, she knew how to smile cheerfully and openly. Not like now, Margaret. Kenneth entered the room, thinking she was still awake, but she didn't respond to his voice or turn to him. He turned off the TV, swept the photos onto the floor, then took a soft warm blanket and covered the sleeping woman. Then he lay down beside her, embracing Margaret, and soon fell asleep himself, not wanting to think about anything bad. In the morning, as usual, they took Angela to school, and Margaret opened the car door for her. Run, sweetie, run. And when the girl couldn't hear her anymore, she turned to Kenneth. Kenneth, I can't do this anymore. The same dream. Michelle is standing at the door. I invite her in, but she shakes her head and stays. Kenneth seemed to have been waiting for these words because he quickly responded. I'm sorry, but if you drink like this and then watch stupid recordings, Michelle will appear in anyone's dreams. We were actually going to kill her when she burned, 
Margaret couldn't hold back. Kenneth grabbed her hand and turned her sharply toward him. Stop it. Okay. Michelle is dead. And we're not to blame for it. I don't want to go back to this topic anymore. And if you have nothing to do, start filming already. I bought you a camera for $10,000. Margaret waved her hands. I don't want to film. Kenneth didn't let her go. Pulled her close and hugged her. Wait, wait, wait. I understand it's hard for you. We're all struggling. I love you. Mom, mom. Angela ran up to them. Yes, sweetheart. Kenneth leaned toward his daughter. After school, we're going to the ferry. Right. You promised. Margaret looked up at Kenneth. Kenneth, he didn't have an answer. So she sat down in front of the girl herself. My darling. Yes, my dear. Of course, I promised you. Can we go tomorrow? You say that every day. Angela was clearly disappointed with her words and turned to her father. Dad, Angela, stop playing these games. Kenneth said sternly to his daughter. Kenneth, Margaret pleaded and he softened his voice. Sunshine, mommy's friend who was in the hospital has been discharged and left. We'll never see her again. Go to class, Sunshine. Fine, the girl said sadly. Come on, bye for now. Kenneth gently nudged his daughter toward the school doors. Bye, Margaret said to her. The girl ran to her friends, and Kenneth, watching her go, calmly remarked. See, she understands perfectly well despite what you say, Kenneth. Margaret pleaded. He took her hand, ending the unpleasant conversation. Let's go. Jason stepped out onto the street and began to lock the gate when Melissa approached him. Hi, Uncle Jason. She greeted loudly. Hello, Melissa. How's your little brother, Anthony? The old man replied warmly. He's good. Can I go to the hospital with you? She got straight to the point. What's this about? Jason was surprised. We have to write an essay at school about someone we respect. I want to write about you and your work. Melissa delivered her prepared speech in advance. Well, I'll definitely be at the hospital until five. And my mom won't let you go into town alone. Jason pondered and promised the girl. I'll talk to her. Okay. She said happily. And, waiting for the neighbor to disappear around the corner, she waved to two boys who were hiding from Jason in the alley. In no time, they climbed over the old fence of his house and found themselves in the yard, burning with both fear and curiosity at the same time. After parting with her parents, Angela arrived at class, but the thought of the unhappy fairy haunted her. Managing to endure the first lesson somehow, the girl approached the teacher and complained of a stomach ache. The teacher promptly took her to the infirmary and then returned to the class since she couldn't leave her students unsupervised for long. Meanwhile, Angela began to complain to the school nurse about her discomfort. Is it hurting that badly? The nurse shook her head. Do you remember your mom's phone number? My mom's already here. The girl lied. She's waiting for me downstairs. Just tell Cynthia to let me go. Show a note, and you can go to your mom. The nurse said, handing her a slip of paper. If you feel worse, have her take you to the hospital. Okay, okay. Angela nodded, clutching the note in her hand as she left the nurse's office. She was confident she would find the hospital where the unfortunate fairy lay and revive her with the magical mirror Margaret had given her. Meanwhile, the fairy, Michelle, lay in Jason's house, unaware that three pairs of curious eyes were watching her. What do you see? Melissa asked one of her friends. Something unclear, he replied, trying to make out anything through the small, murky windows. All right, Gregory, now climb through the window. Open the door for us. And, Melissa ordered, patting the boy on the shoulder. I'm scared. He stuttered slightly. Are you a coward? Melissa snapped at him. Come on, get going. She pushed him angrily towards the window. And Gregory had no choice but to obey his stern friend. Angela was nothing like the decisive Melissa and felt lost when she realized that finding the hospital wasn't as easy as she thought. Miss, where's the hospital? She asked a young woman she bumped into on the street. What hospital? 
The woman didn't understand. She was on the phone and seemed very nervous. Not interested in the girl's problems. Not you. I'm on the phone. She shouted into the receiver to her unseen caller. But Angela was determined and began to explain to her the hospital. There's a fountain. A white car with a stripe. Don't shout. You're annoying. The woman worked away from Angela, immediately forgetting about her. Then, a strangely dressed, unkempt woman with a baby in her arms approached the girl. Who are you looking for? She asked the girl. The fairy. She's in the hospital. Angela explained. The fairy. Well, what a coincidence. The beggar woman shrugged. I'm actually going to see her too. You know, you can't go to a fairy empty-handed. Right? Yeah, that's right. Angela nodded eagerly. And the woman continued, nervously looking around. We need to buy gifts. And all that stuff. She lowered her voice a bit. Do you have any money? Angela shook her head. And the beggar woman sighed. Neither do I. But you know, I've come up with something. Will you come with me? Angela nodded trustingly extended her hand to the stranger and set off with her to find gifts for the fairy because she really wanted to delight her with something very nice. The girl had no idea that at that very moment, two boys were leaning over her fairy. The girl, who was very disappointed to find not a monster but an ordinary woman entangled in some incomprehensible wires, was not impressed. This didn't impress the boys either. And the one who never believed Melissa from the start said to her in annoyance, She doesn't look like a monster at all. And nothing is sewn onto her. We're just wasting time here because of you. Let's go, Gregory. Wait. Melissa didn't want to lose her authority among the street kids. So she quickly came up with a new version. What if Jason is just about to sew her head on? Whose? Gregory didn't understand. Yours? For example... She frightened the already timid boy. Then why is she lying here? Not moving at all. He drugged her. Now he's going to cut off her head and sew on a new one. Melissa, are you out of your mind? The second boy laughed. Because everything was exactly like this in the movie. Melissa saw how her words affected her friends and continued to instill fear in them. And then the monster worked the streets. She stood up and mimicked with her hands how the monster from the movie scared the unfortunate passersby. What do we do now? Gregory asked. Although he was ready to run away from he anywhere, Melissa leaned over Michelle and began to peer into her eyes, gently lifting her eyelids with her fingers. Then she slapped her cheeks hard. Mom, we've come to rescue you. In the underground passage where the stranger led Angela, there was nothing magical, but various passers-by and beggars crowded around the grey walls covered with vulgar graffiti. The woman adjusted the tattered checkered blanket on her child and pulled Angela's hand. Here, you'll sing. And for that, they'll give us a lot of money for the fairy. Understand? Angela nodded and began to sing the song she had heard recently. And the wife will cry. She'll go to another. Sing louder. Sing loud demanded the beggar for my friend she'll forget about me the girl sang in a plaintive voice give young people please the beggar managed to add her word stretching out a box into which they threw money while rocking the baby with her other hand it's a pity only for the will angela sang give woman the beggar pleaded on the wide field the girl looked at her new acquaintance and fell silent while the beggar was already bowing to some passerby. Thank you, sir, I'm tired, Angela declared. Why does the fairy need so much money? Let's go already, sing. I said, the woman got angry. Stand here, give. Thank you, miss, sing. I said, thank you, sir. Angela had already realized that she was being deceived and wouldn't be taken to the fairy, but she continued to sing. And Melissa finally stopped shaking Michelle and waved her hand. She's so weird. Maybe we should disconnect her from all these gadgets. Suggested Gregory. Exactly. Melissa exclaimed. Then she'll wake up. Gregory. Come on. Press here. Melissa started pointing with her finger where her friend needed to press. But their companion held his hand back. Hey. What are you doing? 
What if it's not allowed? It's fine, Melissa declared. Come on, Gregory. Press here. She leaned on the bed and suddenly screamed in a voice not her own. Ah, she grabbed me. She grabbed me, terrified. The kids together released the convulsive grip of the woman and fled from the scary room before something else happened. Meanwhile, clouds continued to gather over Angela's head because a swather dark-eyed man with a cigarette approached the beggar who had led her into the underground passage. So, how's it going? It's been a good day, she boasted, recognizing the main overseer of the beggars. She hurriedly scooped up everything people had thrown to Angela and handed it to him. Where did you get her from? Jack nodded towards the girl. Ha, found her in a cabbage patch. The vagrant chuckled. She's a pretty one. How much do you want for her? Jack got straight to the point. What? She's still just a little kid. The beggar protested. But Jack wasn't joking. How much? He asked again. 300 bucks. The woman brazenly replied. Jack cursed under his breath and added more calmly. I won't give you more than 200. Angela looked fearfully at the angry beggar and her accomplice and decided not to wait to see what would happen next. She couldn't sing anymore. Her throat had dried up long ago, and this man could make her continue this activity. Besides, he was very scary, and the girl belatedly remembered stories about how people like him kidnap children. There was only one way out. To run away. Angela stepped aside and suddenly darted towards the stairs, hurrying to get out of this terrible underground passage. Stop. The beggar threw the child onto the wheelchair she was sitting in herself, and it turned out that all this time she had been holding a doll wrapped in a tattered blanket close to her. But the woman wasn't afraid of being exposed. She dashed after the fleeing girl, shouting as she ran, Where are you going? Oh, you. Stop, kid. Jack also chased after the girl. She was already at the road and, noticing an ambulance on the opposite side of the street, rushed towards it, not noticing that the pedestrian light was red. Stop. Stop. Where are you going? Voices shouted at her from all sides, and immediately there was a deafening screech of brakes. And at that very moment, as if sensing that something had happened to her daughter, Michelle strangely jerked and opened her eyes. Her hands tightly clenched the crumpled sheet. It hurts. Angela cried, showing the paramedic her bruised knee. What could I do? The driver lamented, whose car Angela had narrowly missed being hit by. She appeared at the last moment. Just calm down. Nobody is blaming you. The doctor saw with her own eyes everything that had happened and had no doubts about his innocence. She turned to the injured girl and asked gently, Tell me, what's your name? Angela, she replied quietly. Angela, where's your mom? The woman continued to inquire where the fairy is. Angela explained, surprised at her lack of insight. Interesting. And where is the fairy? The doctor didn't understand anything in the hospital. Angela informed her, there's a big fountain there, columns, and cars like yours. Will you take me there? Right, of course, I'll take you. Don't worry, I'll take the child now. Put her in the car and treat her knee. The doctor said to the driver, let's go, Angela. The girl stood up and walked with her to the ambulance. Meanwhile, Michelle continued to convulse. She tore off all the tubes and fell to the floor but she didn't feel any pain and didn't hear the approaching footsteps of Melissa and her parents. I told you. The pleased girl pointed a finger at Michelle. Be careful with her head. The three of them lifted the unfortunate woman and laid her on the bed. Now you won't say I'm making things up. Melissa declared to her parents and her mother leaned over Michelle and asked, sweetheart, who are you? But at that moment, Jason burst into the room and shouted at the uninvited guests, pushing them away from his patient. Can you explain to me what you're doing here, Brenda? Jason's initial shock passed, and he hurried to explain everything to Melissa's parents. This is my niece. She was in an accident with her parents. She's the only survivor. The hospital refused to take her. She fell into a coma 
and I brought her here. He sat down next to Michelle and spoke soothingly. Quiet, 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 quiet. It's all right. So, did she just wake up now? Kathy, Melissa's mother, didn't understand. It's all right. Jason continued to repeat to Michelle, paying no attention to anyone else. Oh, what joy, Kathy said. Well, we won't disturb you. It's all right, my girl. It's all right. Jason was over the moon with happiness. Jason kept saying only one thing. We made it. We made it. In the ambulance, Angela felt completely calm, unlike in the underground passage when she sang her song to people. And now she believed again that she would definitely find her fairy. Angela, tell me, is this definitely the hospital? The doctor asked when they arrived. Definitely, definitely. Angela nodded. She couldn't be mistaken because she had been here many times with her mom and dad. Now, tell me, where's your mom? The doctor inquired. There she is. The girl tricked, waving her hand at several women in the hall. Is that your mom? The doctor wanted to approach Angela's mother, but at that moment, her phone rang, and she answered the call. Yes, darling, mom's on her way. Yes, yes, I'll definitely buy it. Angela seized the moment to find the ward where the ferry lay, and hurried to the stairs. She knew exactly where to go, but froze in amazement and despair when she saw that instead of the usual door, there was a gaping black hole blocked off by warning tape and the entire ward had been burned to the ground. Stepping into this frightening darkness, Angela suddenly crouched down, noticing a small fairy doll, the one she had given to her fairy herself. Its face was completely blackened, and its dress and wings were crumbled, but she immediately recognized it and tightly held it in her hand. Gloria, the same orderly who always cleaned Michelle's ward, knew Angela well, so when she saw her confidently working down the corridor, she set aside her mop and hurried after her. She didn't manage to stop Angela, and when she reached her, Angela was already standing in the middle of the burnt ward. Aren't you where to look for the fairy now? Angela, what are you doing here? Gloria led her out into the corridor. My God, where's the fairy? Angela raised her eyes to her. Let's go. The woman kissed her on the forehead. Let's go. I'll tell you everything. In Kenneth's office, workers removed from the wall a large portrait of a no longer young, dignified looking man. And as Kenneth glanced at it one last time, he smiled. Now it was his office. And Roger Williams, his deceased wife's father, could go to the scrap heap of history where he belonged. Everything turned out as best as it could, meaning just as it should and there was nothing more to say. The secretary, a beautiful, elegantly dressed girl, approached him but stopped at a respectful distance. Kenneth, everyone's gathered already. She informed him. The board of directors is waiting for you. They'll wait. Kenneth replied, displeased that her appearance had spoiled such a pleasant moment. The girl left, and Kenneth looked at the incoming call from Margaret and answered somewhat nervously. Yes. What do you want? I'm in a meeting. Margaret quickly told him about the teacher's call. What? Angela isn't at school. Furious, Kenneth postponed the meeting and rushed home to pick up Margaret, intending to search for their missing daughter together. Although he already suspected where she might be, surely she was in the hospital because she loved visiting Michelle. No, he should have told her that she had died. Maybe then the girl would have calmed down, but Michelle didn't die. On the contrary, she was gradually coming back to life, and Jason, who was with her, tried to ease her strong, uncontrollable anxiety. It's okay. 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 You're safe. Quiet. Quiet. Calm down. I'll explain everything to you. Do you remember anything? Well, that's how it goes. It's okay, your memory will come back. To avoid lengthy, exhausting explanations, Jason told her a story he had made up long ago. You're my niece. Five years ago, you were in a car accident with your parents. They died. And you, you were in a coma for a very long time. At first in the hospital, 
Now with me, I'm a doctor, a doctor, and I came up with a new method. I gave you injections, but that's not the main thing. The main thing is that you, what, what do you want to ask? Do you want to know what your name is? Your name, your name is Brenda, Brenda. Michelle opened her mouth to repeat her name, but no sound came out and she convulsively twitched a few times. Jason smiled encouragingly at her. He was confident that it would only take a little more time and he would be able to bring her back to normal life. Meanwhile, Gloria was calming down the agitated Angela. This fairy's name is Michelle. When the fire started, she woke up, put on her wings and flew away. She flew high. Where did she fly to? The girl asked. Oh, she flew far away. The orderly continued to assure her. You know how much theories have to do. Oh, so much. Who broke the spell on her? Angela asked the question that was tormenting her. But Margaret and Kenneth were already entering the hospital. And as soon as they saw her, they rushed to her. Oh, my God, my girl. Margaret was sincerely excited. Oh, my God, you scared us so much. My little one. All right. Fantasizer. Kenneth wasn't in a good mood and was very angry with his daughter. Let's go home. Kenneth. Margaret pleaded with him. My dear, what happened to your knee? I'll tell you later. We need to find the fairy. Angela said. Someone broke the spell on her. Remember how you read to me about it. Someone wants her to fulfill something bad. A bad wish. Kenneth categorically refused to entertain this nonsense any longer and sternly told the girl, All right, Angela, there's no furry. No, enough. But Gloria saw her fly away. His daughter retorted, but he wasn't going to entertain her fantasies any longer. All right, that's it. Let's go home. I've had enough. Let's go. Kenneth. Margaret stood up and glanced briefly at Gloria. Please excuse us. Then she turned to Kenneth and spoke with a pleading voice. Kenneth, I'm begging you. He firmly grabbed her shoulders and shook her. If you don't knock this nonsense out of her head, I will. I'll talk to the psychologists and I'll still believe in the fairy. Angela declared, perhaps it was the faith of this little girl that allowed Michelle to come to her senses. But when she tried to say something to Jason, who was massaging her legs, Something incomprehensible came out of the unhappy woman's lips. And then panic flickered in her troubled eyes. Jason understood her agitation perfectly. It's been five years, he said to his patient. Thoughts have atrophied. And you want to start running after just two months. That only happens in movies. Don't worry. A year of massages, exercises, and you'll be good as new. He took a plate of oatmeal scooped some onto a spoon and brought it to Michelle's lips. Come on, easy now. She slightly turned her head aside and Jason deciphered two words that slipped from her lips. I myself, okay, okay. He didn't argue, holding the plate. Try it, be brave, good, here, good, good. He watched as she attempted to grasp the spoon with her disobedient fingers, still cramped with spasms and rejoiced at her first excesses. But the spoon slipped, and the oatmeal flew straight into Michelle's face. Well, it's okay. It's okay. The old man reassured his patient. If you learn it to do this earlier, when you were still a child, then you'll learn now. At that moment, there was a knock on the door, and Jason, placing the plate on the nightstand next to the bed, stepped out to meet the unexpected guest. It was Kathy, Melissa's mother, their neighbor. Thank you, Jason. She began, I've tried everything for this cursed insomnia. I even drank vinegar with honey. By the way, Valerian didn't help me at all. Why didn't you come to me earlier? Jason asked, listening to the noise in the patient's room. The sound of the fallen plate clearly indicated to him that Michelle had attempted to grab it but failed. Kathy continued chattering incessantly. I thought maybe folk remedies would help. I experimented a bit. Kathy, listen, take these pills in the morning. Mix the powders in the evening. 
but the most important thing is to sleep regularly. And don't you dare go to bed in irritation. The commotion in the room intensified, and Jason hurried. No tea, no coffee, known. Here, Kathy placed a huge basket on the table, in which Jason saw a three-liter jug of milk and some other groceries. Here, why all this, Kathy? The old man protested. You have kids too. No, no, Jason. You are not alone now either. Feed your niece. Kathy understood from the noise in the next room that she was delaying her kind neighbor and hurried to bid him farewell. I'm off now. All right. All right. He called after her over his shoulder, then rushed to Michelle, who had fallen to the floor, and began to wrest the scalpel from her weak hands, which she was trying to grasp tightly. No. No. He pushed away the tray of instruments she had dropped and spoke to her as if she were a little child. It's okay. Calm down. She wheezed and struggled in his arms, and he repeated to her, barely holding back his own tears. You have to live. You have to. Do you hear me? You have to. And long, filled with both despair and joy, days flowed for both him and Michelle. The young woman's recovery was difficult, but Jason never stopped taking care of her. Michelle, like a little child, learned to sit, eat by herself, speak, draw, distinguish colors, and even read. And within a year, she was already attempting to work, at first with walkers and crutches, and then on her own. But Jason was always there beside her, supporting her, repeating every time, you can do it, Brenda, you can. Come on, come on, come on. Be brave, be brave, be brave. There, good, come on, well done. Come on, come on, come on. And then the day came when she was able to take her first independent step. Hold on, all right, now try it on your own. Come on, be brave, there you go. See, you did it. The old man encouraged her, it worked. Michelle couldn't hide her joy, Jason. It worked. Yes, my dear. He helped her to reach a bench and sat her down so she could rest. It worked. Michelle echoed, trying to catch her breath. It worked. Jason was as delighted as his patient. There you go. Rest. And when will I start remembering? Michelle asked. But Jason didn't have a chance to answer her because he saw his own son walking towards them along the path. Hey, mind if I join? Larry asked his father, come in, come in, for two months, you've been Mia. Larry continued addressing his father, still not paying attention to Michelle. I was starting to worry, you could at least. Suddenly, he stopped himself mid-sentence, staring at the young woman with a scarf on her head. Oh, well, isn't this the same? He blurted out, yes, this is Brenda. Jason clearly wasn't pleased with his son's arrival and tried to hide from Michelle that his closest person was in front of her. My niece, he told the unexpected guest, I've told you about her. Brenda, this is Larry, my colleague. Hello. Michelle nodded and stood up. You'll practice on your own, all right. Jason suggested to her, that's good. Take a seat. Larry and I will take a work. We will, won't we? Larry, of course. Larry didn't argue with his father. After you, he pointed to the gate. They walked out to a small lake that stretched almost immediately behind Jason's house. Dad, you are lucky. Larry admired. Listen, with her amnesia, there's a chance to smoothly finish the experiment. But what will happen when she starts remembering? She'll remember. And then I'll think. His father calmly replied. But right now, I have other things on my mind. How do I submit the documents to the Ministry of Health? That's exactly what I wanted to talk to you about. Larry cautiously broached the subject that worried him. You understand perfectly well that they won't accept any documents from you. Yes, Jason replied. He was genuinely afraid of this. And Larry continued to exacerbate the situation, making his father even more worried. And they'll start an investigation too. Yes, Jason understood all of this perfectly well even without him. 
That's why I am thinking about how to handle this. Maybe through your connections. I've already consulted. Consulted. Larry pretended to be dismayed for appearance's sake. Then suddenly spoke with a confident tone. Dad, this is your only chance to publicize your research. Just understand me correctly. Hand it over to someone involved in medicine. Legally, hand it over. Jason paused, expecting anything but this. Hand it over. Dad, hand it over. Larry continued to press him. To whom? The old man slightly raised his voice. Hand it over. Please, just listen to me now. Larry lost his temper for a moment. To whom? Jason exclaimed. I'll run it through my lab. Larry quickly went on. I'll tweak the data. Everything will be legal. No, I won't give it to anyone. Jason no longer intended to hold back. I won't give it to anyone. Not even to my own son. He turned around and walked away. And Larry, frozen for a split second, immediately hurried after him. I knew it. I knew it. You don't care about Michelle. You don't care about all these people. You just want fame, don't you? Larry shouted. And you? Jason stopped and looked his son in the eyes. I want to help you, Dad. Larry grabbed his father by the collar. Do you? His father asked angrily. By putting your name under my discovery. I gave you my life 20 years ago. I took the blame for you. I could have made this discovery back then. But you gave the guy the wrong solution. You buried my experiment and me. Jason flushed with anger. But Larry wasn't going to yield to him. And the reminder of the past didn't faze him at all. Enough. Enough. He shouted in his father's face. No one asked you to save my skin. You would have gotten out of it yourself. And don't make me out to be an ungrateful sleazeball. I helped you with the equipment. I supplied you with donor material. Yes. Of course. Jason replied sarcastically. And money. Larry yelled. Wasn't I giving you enough money? Money. Jason was incensed by this reminder. But his son was sure of his righteousness. Money. He confirmed. Thanks. Jason worked back to the house. Dad. Please. Larry caught up with him and began to speak urgently and imploringly. Can you imagine what this means for us? This is a breakthrough in neurosurgery. People will talk. They'll write about it. And money. We won't need anything. You don't need anything as it is. His father told him. Dad. Larry's distorted face became unrecognizable and frightening. I'll restore our family's honor. No one will say that you, the weirdo, killed a manual. I didn't kill anyone. Jason unexpectedly calmly said, shaking his gray head and interrupting the conversation. Larry also instantly cooled down. He looked at his father's stooped back and blurted out, tears of desperation welling up. That's not what I meant. Well, meanwhile, Michelle was pedaling on the exercise bike that Jason had made for her. Melissa sat next to her on the branch of a sprawling apple tree, watching her little brother twiddle a twig between his fingers while sitting on a log. The girl told Michelle, rings, and other small things. He used to cut out snowflakes from all of mom's dresses. That's when I got it. Do you have kids? She unexpectedly asked. Me? No. Michelle suddenly fell silent, then added uncertainly, maybe, suddenly, she remembered a wonderful warm day when she, still pregnant, was walking in the park, and the man next to her was taking her picture, hugging her, and spinning her around. You are so beautiful. She heard his voice and laughed, and the next memory was even more unbelievable. She saw not only her husband, holding their newborn daughter in his arms, but also her father, and even a friend whispering, looking at the baby, oh, how precious. Michelle snapped out of it, hearing Melissa's thoughtful voice. I won't have kids either, the girl said. What's the point of them anyway? Boring, and they ruin everything. Jason entered the yard, and it was immediately evident that he was in a good mood. What's this? He playfully scolded Melissa. This apple tree is older than you, young lady. Come down now, quickly. 
Come on. He lifted the giggling girl off the branch, then approached Michelle. I have a daughter, she told him, and a husband. I have a daughter. Why have you never told me about her? The smile faded from the old man's face. I didn't know. He lied, somewhat flustered. What about her? Michelle wanted to know everything. Was she in the car with me? Did she die? No, she didn't die. Jason simply couldn't tell her anything else. And my husband. Michelle continued to press. He didn't die either. Jason looked away to avoid the young woman's gaze. Then where are they? She asked persistently. We haven't been in touch with your mother for a long time. He finally came up with an answer. I don't know anything, Brenda. Then find them. Find them. Michelle demanded. Find my daughter and my husband. Is that so hard? He must be looking for me, surely. Yes, Jason sighed. He's looking. He already understood that her memory was returning, and now it would be so difficult to explain anything to her. And every night Michelle began to dream fragments from her past, and she was sure that not long ago her dreams had been reality. Say mama. Mama, Michelle's own voice emerged in her memory. And in her arms, she held a little girl, a lovely baby, so cute and beautiful. Why are you bothering the child? Her husband would say, and she recognized his tone. There will be a time when she'll say everything herself. Did you hear? Michelle smiled. Hear what? He laughed. Come on. Don't make things up. She said it again. Michelle insisted. Didn't you hear? Her memories resembled a kaleidoscope. Here's her little one celebrating her first birthday. Here's the baby sleeping in the stroller. And Michelle lovingly gazes at her little miracle. It's all in the grandfather, you know. All in the grandfather. Michelle's father leaned over his granddaughter. And she smiled and beckoned someone. Come on, faster. Here are the headlights of an oncoming car blinding Michelle and she grips the steering wheel with her last strength, while someone unfamiliar shouts, we're losing her, massive blood loss. And at the registry office, the officiator asks the happy bride, are you ready, Michelle Williams, to take Kenneth Young as your husband? Michelle woke up screaming, drenched in cold sweat, trying to fall asleep again but couldn't. She remembered enough to know the truth that someone had been diligently trying to hide from her, and now, all doubts were behind her, and the pain too remained in the past. Standing in front of her family home's door, Michelle hesitated to press the doorbell. She turned around and looked around. Yes, this was her home. So many memories were tied to this place that there could be no doubt that she had returned to where she was awaited. She brought her finger to the doorbell and pressed it. Margaret peeked out the window to see who had come and, pale with horror, recoiled deciding she was losing her mind. Meanwhile, unsuspecting Kenneth, smiling, opened the door and suddenly froze, recognizing the wife he had come to think of as dead. Kenneth, it's me, she said to him, expecting anything but the indistinct and hurried reply. I'm not Kenneth, you've mistaken me. He closed the door in front of the bewildered Michelle and leaned his back against the cold wall trying to gather his thoughts. With a loud bark, a white Labrador rushed towards Michelle. She took his big head in her hands and started petting him, affectionately saying, Tucker, you're my good boy. Tucker, another ring made Margaret jump. Kenneth, Kenneth, this, she started, pointing at the door. This is like, how Kenneth, in my dream, is this Kenneth? She, she died. Didn't she? No, she's alive, Kenneth replied. Who is it? Kenneth. Did she come after us? Margaret couldn't hide her fear. Quiet, quiet, quiet. She never left. Kenneth saw that Margaret was on the verge of hysteria and hurried to calm her down, switching to a whisper. They showed us chod remains and said it was Michelle, and we believed it. The question is different. Where has she been for a whole year? And why did she only show up now? And the door kept ringing and ringing. Kenneth, just open it for her, Margaret requested. All the documents are with me, Kenneth continued, and the sound of his own voice calmed him down. 
the death certificate. I inherited the rights. She won't prove anything. Open it. Margaret shouted. It was as if she didn't hear his words, and she rushed to the door. But he grabbed her and covered her mouth with his hand. Quiet. We won't open anything for anyone. This is not Michelle. This is not Michelle. This is a fraud. Just a fraud. Well, well, this is Michelle, Margaret whispered, subsiding into Kenneth's embrace. Who else knows about this? You and I. Come to me. Quiet. They were not only insistent, but also tender, and Margaret obediently complied, and tears flowed down her cheeks. Without waiting for Kenneth, Michelle headed to her father's office, but when she asked about him from the security guard, he briefly told her about his death. Dead. Michelle echoed him. I haven't worked here yet, but all the newspapers wrote about him. Haven't you read them? She didn't answer him and, staggering as if drunk, walked away. But her strength left her, and she pressed against the stone wall of the building, quietly whispering the cherished word, Dad. Margaret entered Kenneth's office with the customary glass of brandy in her hand. He approached and took the alcohol from her. Please, I need it, Margaret pleaded. You promised. Kenneth written to his papers. Kenneth, we can't just pretend she doesn't exist all the time. Margaret's voice broke. Kenneth, it's maddening. She sat down on a chair and burst into tears. It's cruel. Seven years ago, were you able to sleep with your best friend's husband? Kenneth asked her quietly. Where is all this pity coming from now? Margaret's tears dried up instantly. My friend slept with the man who was supposed to be my husband. She said, oh, yes, of course, you're the victim in this story. Kenneth smirked back. It was me who forced you into the chance encounter at the cafe. Living off her father, deceiving a friend, enduring. What a villain I am. Yes, Kenneth, you're a villain. Margaret approached him, speaking quickly but with a subdued voice. A villain. And I'm a fool. A fool. Because I waited. Waited for you to finally get enough of all this money. With nervous movements, she adjusted her hair, then turned sharply to Kenneth. Just tell me one thing. If it weren't for that accident, would you have divorced her? He didn't answer right away, and Margaret burst into laughter covering her head with her hands, and her laughter turned into hysterical sobbing. Think about it. Where would you be now if I had divorced Michelle? Calm returned to Kenneth momentarily. But you can't. Margaret moaned. And how can you? He leaned towards her. How can you? All my life I've been trying to get out of the crap I was born into. Was it easier for you with your alcoholic mother? And Michelle? She was born with a silver spoon. She doesn't even know what it's like when there's no money. So let her find out now. He wanted to say something else, but he fell silent, trying to gather his thoughts and find that convincing argument that would finally calm Margaret down. But she wasn't going to listen to him and only shook her head. She doesn't deserve this. Kenneth decided to give her one last argument. Do you want me to go after her and bring her back to this house, to this life? He asked. She raised her tired eyes to him and nodded several times. Irritated by her stubbornness, he abruptly grabbed her face and squeezed her cheeks in his fingers. Then you won't be in this life, he hissed spitefully. But when Angela's voice was heard, he released Margaret and glanced out of the office door. Mom. Mom. The girl was looking for Margaret and calling her loudly. She didn't notice her father, and he returned to Margaret and brought his eyes close to hers. And Angela won't call you mom. He whispered and left, while Margaret burst into tears again, unable to cope with the grief that had befallen her. Of course, she took Michelle's place and shouldn't be here, but how difficult it is to lose what had been hers alone for five long years. Michelle stood at the police station, listening as the duty officer, whom she had turned to for help, made a call. Hello. Yes. Check in the database, please, for a Michelle Williams. Ah, he listened to his caller's response and asked Michelle, who was patiently awaiting his decision. Do you think no one will recognize you? Interesting. 
the duty officer returned to the phone call. Yes, 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 I'm listening. Yes, ah, whose daughter? He looked at Michelle oddly, then extended the receiver in surprise. Ah, I see. All right, thanks. He hung up, stood up, and walked over to Michelle. You know what? Don't worry. Don't fret. He gestured towards a bench. Just sit down for now. Sit down. I'll call the investigator. We'll sort everything out. You'll get everything back. Everything will be returned. Sit down. Sit down. Michelle obediently did as the officer asked. And he returned to the phone and dialed someone else's number again. Hello. Yes. Hey. He started hastily. Remember I asked you about this Michelle? Well, she's asking for the investigator. But we don't need an investigator here. If she came here herself pretending to be alive, then clearly we need to call a doctor. You understand? And you understand, if she's like this, then obviously everything is. Michelle saw him twirling his finger by his temple, got up, and without saying a word, left the station. She decided to return to where she had been living for the past year. When she entered the house, Jason was sitting thoughtfully at the table, stirring the cold tea with a spoon. He turned to her, and she immediately understood how deeply he was moved. I never thought I'd see you again, Brenda. The old man said to her, I'm Michelle. She replied, you remembered. Jason nodded and smiled at her. The snow-covered bushes, trees, pathways, and monuments of the cemetery as Jason and Michelle slowly made their way to the grave where an unknown person was buried under her name. Jason held her hand and recounted the sad tale of his life. The patient died the next morning. I was blocked off from my son. And I was thinking, what will happen to me? I was a renowned neurosurgeon. I had connections. But it happened. Twenty years ago, I lost everything. And then you came along. Same diagnosis. And they were going to disconnect you from life support. Dad wanted to disconnect me. Michelle couldn't believe it. No. A parent cannot disconnect their own child. The old man shook his grey head. If I remember correctly, he had a heart attack. A month after the accident. So, Kenneth. Michelle lowered her gaze and looked at the ground beneath her. And there was no hope of you waking up from the coma. What is he to be judged for? He waited for five years. Jason tried to justify Kenneth. But it didn't make Michelle feel any better. She stood there, looking at the large monument with her name and surname engraved on it. Next to the inscription, a white angel folded its wings in prayer. But there was no portrait of Michelle anywhere. Only intricate white letters. A quote in an unfamiliar language. What does it say here? Michelle asked Jason. Beloved by us more than anyone else. He explained. That's how it sounds in Latin. Kenneth. Michelle said sarcastically. And then her eyes filled with tears. What if I'm not her? What if the real Michelle Williams is buried here? I'm not even sure if I remembered the truth about myself. I'm not Michelle. You are Michelle. Jason tried to reassure her. I'm not Michelle. She shook her head, feeling like she was slowly losing her mind because of all this. You are Michelle. The old man repeated. But she no longer knew who to believe. So she simply said softly in response. No, I'm not Michelle. She repeated the intrusive thought for several days. Unable to shake it official tired, lonely, devastated. She walked along the street on a chilly evening, not looking up at Passersby when a man called out to her, Michelle. She stopped and slowly turned to him. I can see you are not yourself. Ha. Huh. But you are. What's wrong, Michelle? Michelle. She repeated, painfully trying to remember who stood before her. The name of the man, Mike, surfaced in her memory. Of course, they had studied together once. But it had been a long time since they last saw each other. Yet, he recognized her. And it wasn't easy. She had changed over the years. Not just externally, but internally as well. Mike remained silent. Frowning as he watched her trembling. Unsure if it was from the cold or from an emotion unfamiliar to him. 
In an attempt to help her regain composure and calm down, he suggested going to a cafe to talk over a cup of hot coffee. She agreed, grateful that at least someone was willing to get involved in her fate, and began her long and difficult narrative. Listen, Michelle, I. Mike began hesitantly when she fell silent. I've never heard a stranger's story in my five years of practicing law. If someone else told me this, I wouldn't believe it. Well, I wouldn't have believed it myself that Kenneth could have me disconnected. She admitted, that's actually the most ordinary part of the story. Mike countered, one spouse decides to take the other's property and it's not about that. I'm sure Kenneth paid for euthanasia because he wanted what was best for me. Michelle was very agitated and couldn't calm down, but Mike seemed to pay no attention to it. Ah, yes, and that's why he didn't recognize you. He chuckled. I wouldn't have recognized myself either. Michelle tried to justify her husband's strange actions. Well, I recognized you, Mike stated categorically. How many years has it been since we saw each other after college? Seven years. Come on. He waved his hand. You can consider your Kenneth an innocent victim. But please, don't just sit around. Oh, my God. Mike, what can I do? She shook her head. I don't even know anyone here. My dad insisted we move here. He had some business here. Who is we? Mike frowned again. Ah. My husband and Margaret. My friend, Michelle explained. She had some filming here, and then she decided to stay, and she didn't recognize you. He clarified, oh, I just couldn't find her. Michelle was very nervous and spoke disjointedly and sharply. They didn't let me in at home, and they didn't let me go to work. Margaret, you say? Mike pulled out his daily planner and placed it on the table. From television, yes, she confirmed. All right, good. He decided immediately that he must help the woman in trouble and therefore got straight to the point. Michelle, think about who else might know you here. Well, I attended English classes here. She said after some thought, classes, all right. Mike made a note in his planner and looked closely at Michelle, trying to see the old fiery spark in her troubled eyes but she looked at him with anxiety and despair. But who will remember? She said doubtfully. And the maternity hospital. I gave birth to Angela there, the doctors there. She wiped the tears running down her cheeks. But I don't know. I wonder how she is now. Mike didn't let her stray from the topic and urged her on. Come on, Michelle, keep going. We need all the places where you might have left traces of your presence. All the people you talk to, yes, his confidence suddenly influenced her, and she repeated, yes, it will be useful in court, he explained, in court. Michelle asked again, well, yes, he nodded, and let your Kenneth try not to recognize you there, Kenneth has nothing to do with it. She hurried, still not believing in the treachery of her husband, whom she loved so much, well, yes, of course. Mike habitually trusted only the facts and had no intention of justifying Kenneth, who had acted so despicably towards his wife. Come on, Michelle, remember, who else? Um, she paused for a moment, gathering her thoughts. Our college friends, great. Mike encouraged her, and she continued more enthusiastically. My school, my clinic there. I was also listed in the clinic here, there. Here, at the clinic, Mike wrote everything down, not wanting to miss a single detail. Aunt, Michelle suddenly exclaimed. Aunt, Mike repeated mechanically. I have a real aunt. Michelle was delighted with this memory, tucked a strand of hair that had fallen on her forehead, and looked at Mike with a special hope. Now that's interesting. The meaning of her words seemed to have just dawned on him, and he nodded approvingly. But she lives in Paris. Michelle said apologetically, no problem, we'll get her out of Paris. Mike was clearly pleased with this new development. Do you remember her name, surname, and contact details? Yes, so. Donna Williams. Michelle wanted to help Mike very much, but suddenly became flustered. 
but she's been married so many times. I don't know. She might have a different surname. And I don't remember her address. All right. That's enough for today. Mike decided that he had enough information for now. And Michelle needed to rest. But before parting ways with her, he smiled at her and said quite seriously, covering her hand with his palm, Michelle, everything will be all right. Thank you. She thanked him sincerely and added, but I think all this won't be necessary. Kenneth will recognize me and everything will fall into place. But Kenneth wasn't in a hurry to recognize her. And when she came back to her former home and rushed in front of her husband's car, he barely managed to stop. Kenneth, Kenneth, Michelle shouted at him, hoping he could reach his closed heart. Kenneth, Kenneth, get away from the car. He snapped, looking at her as if she were a stranger. Have you lost your mind? Kenneth, it's me. Michelle clung to the car. Your wife, Michelle, my wife is dead. Kenneth cut her off and pressed on the gas pedal. Kenneth, Kenneth, you sleep on your stomach. She shouted after him. Coffee with milk. No sugar. You play chess alone. Kenneth. Kenneth. She ran after him until she fell. But he drove away. Casting a vacant glance in the rearview mirror. And said indifferently as if she could hear him. I don't play chess. Michelle got up and. Trembling with excitement. Worked through the closing gates. Then she rang the doorbell. And when Margaret opened it. She loudly called her daughter by name. Angela. Who? Who are you? Margaret decided to play along. But Michelle pushed her away and worked into the house. For heaven's sake. At least you don't pretend. She said to her. I'll call the police right now. Margaret said with a trembling voice. Trying to block the path of her former friend. Great. Call them. Michelle smirked. You can also tell them what you and Kenneth planned. Let me in, you. Margaret continued to insist. You've got the wrong house. Yes, I got the wrong house. Michelle's voice sounded confident and mocking at the same time. And also the wrong husband and the wrong friend. You live here in my house with my husband, my life. Margaret, tell me, can you keep living like this? Can you? Michelle wiped away large tears from her cheeks and began to climb the stairs to the second floor, where her daughter's room was. Angela, Angela, a white Labrador came running towards her, Tucker. Michelle greeted him happily, but she couldn't find Angela. Her daughter was not in her room, and Michelle only saw her daughter's drawings and a certificate for singing a song about her mom. Michelle returned to her friend with determination, sat down in front of her, and took her hand, Margaret. She spoke fervently. I'll leave everything to you and Kenneth. The business, the money, the house, everything. But I beg you, give me back my daughter. Margaret swiftly got up and unexpectedly said in a hoarse, unrecognizable voice. I don't know who you are. And you will never cross the threshold of my house again, Margaret. Michelle tried to reason with her friend. But she was already shouting at the top of her lungs. Get out of here, Margaret. Michelle raised her voice, but Margaret couldn't hear her. Red with anger, Margaret repeated only one thing. Get out. Get out. And when Michelle left, Margaret collapsed into hysteria. Kenneth, she wants to take. She wants to take our daughter. She wants to take my daughter. Mine. Do you hear? Yes. Michelle wanted only that. So she went to the school where Angela studied. Excuse me. Do you know where 2B is? She asked the boys standing on the steps and chatting about something. Second grade is over there. They eagerly pointed out. Thank you. Michelle nodded and headed in the direction the boys had shown her. There were many girls in the schoolyard. And she couldn't guess which one was Angela. But Angela, turning around by chance, recognized her and ran up to her leaving her friends behind. Fairy, I knew it. I knew that mom and dad were lying to me. Where were you? Did anything bad happen to you? I still have your magic mirror. Do you still need it? Before Michelle could say anything to her daughter, the teacher called her, gathering the children to take them to class. Angela, 
Angela. The girl quickly turned at her voice and looked back at Michelle. Please, don't leave again. Wait for me over there in the park, where mom and I eat ice cream. I'll come after classes, when the big hand is on 12 and the little one is here, on the 3. Bye. Hot tears streamed down the unhappy woman's cheeks as her daughter disappeared through the school doors. Angela was so beautiful, so sweet, and she looked so much like her, like Michelle, her mother. Feeling weak in the knees, Michelle went to the spot where Angela promised to meet her and began to wait, anticipating when that annoying little hand would finally reach the coveted three. Meanwhile, Margaret continued to struggle in hysteria, and when Kenneth returned home and tried to lift her from the chair to take her to the bedroom and tuck her into bed, she screamed at him, don't touch me, come on, get up. Kenneth surprisingly remained patient. Quiet, 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 don't touch me, I said. Margaret struggled out of his grasp. Come on, come on, get up. Kenneth struggled with the crying woman. I won't give Angela to her, do you hear? Never give her my Angela, never. She'll have more children, she'll have girls. And I'll never have anything because of her. Because of you. Because of you. To sober her up a bit, Kenneth waved his hand, and a red mark appeared on Margaret's cheek. It startled her a little, and she spoke in a different tone, softly and calmly. Kenneth, I'm begging you, give her everything. The house, the money, everything. Just don't take Angela away from me, Angela. Please, we won't give anything to anyone. Kenneth whispered in Margaret's ear, holding her tightly. Please, Margaret repeated. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Finally, he managed to lead her to the bedroom and somehow calm her down. He didn't know that Michelle, at that very moment, was hugging their daughter, repeating her precious name, Angela. I've been thinking about you all day. The girl told her fairy, ah. Michelle looked into her daughter's eyes, stroking her face and hands. You won't ever sleep again, right? The girl rejoiced, right? Michelle promised her. Can you fly to your parents and tell them I'm not lying? Mom will come to pick me up soon. Angela, I have something to tell you. Michelle started, but her daughter seemed not to hear her and said what worried her most. Mom will find out that you woke up and be happy. Will you come tomorrow? I will too. Just remember, little hand on three, big one on twelve. Then she quickly kissed Michelle on the cheek and ran off, hoping to delight her mom soon. Michelle stood up and hurriedly wiped away the tears that she had shed so often lately. She already knew she would do everything for this Angela to call her mom, because that was truly how she felt. When she got home, she saw Mike sitting next to Jason. Well. He was saying to the old man as he tossed logs into the stove. With such a story, it's unlikely they'll take you as a witness. And what about the investigations? Before Jason could answer, she entered the room and collapsed weakly onto the bed. Michelle, what's wrong with you? Mike was concerned. Are you feeling okay? Fine, she replied. Just had a bit of a tough day. Headache. Michelle, I have good news. Mike smiled. The court date to overturn the decision declaring you dead is set for the 15th. And tomorrow we're meeting with my friend, a journalist. He'll write an article about you. We'll post your photo on all internet platforms asking anyone who knows you to come forward. But instead of being joyful, Michelle lowered her gaze. She calls her mom. She said softly, covering her face with her hand. The men fell silent. They simply didn't know what to say to that. Kenneth went to pick up his daughter from school himself and tried his best to appear calm and even cheerful. He smiled when Angela asked him, Where's mom? Mom. Mom's sleeping. She's not feeling well. He explained, then asked his daughter a question too. Sweetheart, who's the woman the teacher told me about? The one you were talking to near the stadium. I won't tell. Angela stubbornly replied, you won't believe anyway. Why wouldn't I believe? I'll believe. Was it a fairy? Kenneth kept smiling. But there was something in his eyes that made the girl fib. Dad, what are you talking about? 
She shrugged. Fairies don't exist. I want to go to Mon. Yes. Yes. Go on. Go on. He quickly let her go. Only now did he notice an envelope with a seal on the coffee table. Summons. Kenneth whispered. Thinking about Michelle with disgust. She decided to sue. The logs crackled peacefully in the stove. And Michelle, enjoying its fragrant and almost alive warmth, listened calmly to Mike, who for some reason decided to reminisce about their college days. And you, as always, stood on the sidelines in that green dress. He said, Do you remember the color of my graduation dress? She asked, surprised. Of course, he smirked. Only your eyes were green. And there was also a butterfly in your hair, right here. He touched her hair. But Michelle wasn't inclined to continue that conversation. She's so grown up now. She said, thinking of her daughter. She sets her own schedule. Michelle. Mike was a bit disappointed. Though he understood her feelings. I saw her for the last time when she was just a little one. Missed so much. Michelle remarked bitterly. Michelle, I'll get your daughter back. I promise. Mike succumbed to the charm of the woman sitting next to him. And she felt it. Sorry. I understand you're trying to distract me. She sadly smiled. Just, she's there. And I can't do anything. Yes, you're here. And for now, you can't change anything. So maybe just stay here. With me. By the way, you never danced with me at the prom. You know how your refusal hit my self-esteem. He joked. I can imagine. Oh, I can imagine. Michelle smiled. Indeed. The first guy in college. And then getting turned down. Can't imagine. Oh, I can't imagine. Mike got up. Approached the old radio and tried to find a music station. And when he finally succeeded, he went up to Michelle and reached out to her. Ah, oh, well, don't refuse now. He lightly touched her lips, and Michelle didn't push him away. On the contrary, she responded to the kiss and wrapped her arms around his neck. What about Jason? He asked quietly. Jason's on duty until night. She replied, closing her eyes and surrendering to long-forgotten sensations. But suddenly, Mike recoiled from her, noticing flashes of rapidly spreading fire in the flames. Someone had set fire to the old man's house after propping open the front door from outside. Neighbors rushed to the fire. Faster, people. They hurried. Where's Jason? We're here. Mike shouted to them, lifting the unconscious Michelle into his arms. Take Michelle. Take Michelle. And the crowd fretted pouring buckets of water on the raging flames. Quickly. Come on. Quick. Got it. Careful. Careful. Watch your feet. Put it out. Jason returned home when everything was already over. Sitting in the neighbor's room, who sheltered the fire victims, he hung his head in despair. Everything burned down. The equipment. The medicines. Nothing's left. What do we do now? I don't know. How to live? And we're to live. He lamented. Jason. Come on. What are you saying? We're not going to kick you out. Kathy. Melissa's mom. Reassured him. All my records burned. Years of experiments. The old man was deeply saddened. The fire wasn't an accident. Mike said. I saw. Melissa began. But her mother. Knowing her daughter's wild fantasies. Cut her off. Melissa. Let the adults talk. The door was locked from the outside. Mike continued, ignoring the girl's words. But she, as always, was resolute. Okay, but I saw a man with a canister. Who did you see? Mike leaned toward her. In Jason's garden, he was running toward the road. The girl explained, and what were you doing in Jason's garden? Her mother exclaimed, throwing her hands up. I wasn't spying. Honestly, Melissa began to defend herself. No, no, this can't be. Jason couldn't believe that someone could do this intentionally. Who would want to set fire to my house? Larry, Larry, my son, he's incapable of that. The old man was deeply upset and Mike hurried to reassure him. I know who's capable. The next day, 
An article appeared in the local newspaper, and Kenneth read it. The story has become even more convoluted. The fire only confirms that someone is very uninterested in Michelle Williams reclaiming her former life. In any case, we'll have to wait for the trial. Soon, all the dots will be connected in this story. After finishing, Kenneth threw the newspaper on the table, and Margaret, who was sitting right there, raised her eyes to him. Kenneth, why did you do this? I didn't set the house on fire, he said calmly. Kenneth, stop it, Margaret insisted. You weren't home that day. I was meeting with the Germans. You know perfectly well, he told her as if she were a child. Fine, fine, do as you please. She got up and approached him, grabbing the newspaper and showing him the article. Another scandal from the afterlife. But I don't want to see any more of this. And I don't want to hear anything about Michelle. I'm saving our family again. Kenneth shouted at her. And you are not involved. You are doing well. And I didn't set the house on fire. Margaret heard his words, but didn't return to the office. She went up to Angela's room and sat down next to her on the chair. Sweetheart, how are you? Mom, I'm bored. She complained. Can I please go to school tomorrow? My dear girl, I've already explained to you. Margaret wanted to be convincing. You'll stay home until your father and I find a new school. A new one. But all my friends are there. Angela was genuinely upset by her parents' decision. My sunshine. In the new school, there will be new friends. Margaret smiled and, to distract the girl, offered. Do you want me to help you with this? Which one? This one. Angela showed her the task, and Margaret began to read. In the first box, there were seven kilograms of potatoes, and in the second one, there were three kilograms more. How many kilograms of potatoes were in the second box? But Angela decided to talk to her about something else right now. Mom, what's wrong? Dad's angry, and you're crying all the time. Did I do something wrong? No. Darling, Margaret's eyes filled with tears. No. No way. You, you're not to blame for anything here. I can ask the fairy to fix everything. Angela promised. She can grant wishes now, and I can ask her. What? Wait. Fairy. Margaret became flustered. You saw her. Just don't tell dad. The girl pleaded. She's real. Alive and she was waiting for me in the park. Listen to me, Angela, there's no furry. Margaret said hurriedly, you are just like dad. Angela waved her hand disappointedly. Angela, listen, she's an evil witch. Margaret started to make up on the spot, very evil. She disguised herself as a fairy to deceive you and to steal. Promise me that you'll never hear me, never ever go near her and especially never talk to her. Okay, she hugged the girl tightly, while Michelle waited in vain for her daughter, sitting on a bench in the park opposite the school. She waited for a long time, a very long time. But Angela never came, trying to appear calm. Kenneth waved his hand to the unexpected visitor who came to his office. Come in, Mike. Come in, have a seat. Thanks, I'll stand. He stood up crossing his arms over his chest. Kenneth didn't argue and just smirked, but I'm afraid you're mistaken. I have nothing to do with rescheduling the court date, really. Mike didn't believe him. I'll tell you a secret. Kenneth continued. It's in my best interest for this nightmare to end as soon as possible. I've checked up on you. You're a good lawyer, honest. Thank you. Mike didn't fall for flattery, but still couldn't understand Kenneth's angle and smiled when he asked. So, why are you representing fraudsters this time? Listen, who are you trying to deceive? Me or yourself? I've known Michelle since college. I see. Kenneth decided to end the conversation. But I'm afraid you'll lose this case. Dear lawyer, listen. You can bribe anyone. Mike warned him and postponed the court date indefinitely. The law is on our side. The law is on the side of those with money and connections. You're a grown man. It's time to understand such things, Kenneth remarked. And now, 
please leave my office. Fine. See you in court. In a month, Michelle kept coming back to the same park where she had met Angela after their long separation. No one has been waiting for anyone for a long time. Like you, said an unfamiliar old man walking his little dog there. Every day at the same time. I'm even curious myself whether he'll come or not. Do you love him so much? What could Michelle say to him? How could she explain the situation she found herself in? And is any man worthy of such love as her little daughter's? Michelle silently looked at her watch and left, planning to return here again tomorrow. But one day, as Michelle sat again on the same bench next to the grey-haired old man, Angela, unable to bear her confinement any longer, simply ran away from home, leaving a note for Margaret not to worry. If he's late, I'll tell him, promised Michelle to her new acquaintance. But at that moment, Angela, spreading her arms, ran up to her. Fairy, Michelle covered her with kisses. Angela, shall we go? Shall we go? And the old man, still not understanding anything, just shook his head, watching them go. Margaret, unaware of her daughter's action, finished her glass and then, swaying, left the room. Angela, Angela, sweetie, are you hungry for lunch? Suddenly, she caught sight of a note with beautiful, school-like handwriting. Mom, I'll be back. Oh my God, exclaimed Margaret, picking up the phone and dialing Kenneth's number. Oops, Kenneth, Angela ran away. Meanwhile, Michelle and Angela, holding hands, worked and talked, as they had so much to say to each other. You're not really a witch, are you? Angela asked, really? Mom thinks so. If you don't have wings, then you are not a fairy. I'll be a fairy for you. If you want, promised Michelle. And how many wishes can I make to you? The little girl inquired. As many as you need. So make as many as you want. Smiled Michelle. Well, exclaimed Angela excitedly. Then I want mom to stop crying and not take her medicine. And dad not to yell. And for me to be allowed out of the house. And to have a little parrot. Can I, Angela? Michelle sat down in front of her daughter, looking into her eyes. Are you not allowed out of the house? Yes, and mom wants to take me somewhere. The girl confessed. But I don't want to go. Angela, will you come with me? Michelle decided to take her away right now, as there might not be another chance. Where? To a magical land. Angela rejoiced. Kenneth, furious, yelled at Margaret gripping the steering wheel with both hands. You're just like your mother. Our daughter is roaming the city, and you don't know where she is. They had been driving around the city for half an hour, but there was no sign of the girls. Suddenly, Margaret exclaimed, Stop. Stop, 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 stop. Right here. Yes, stop here. Margaret saw Michelle and Angela, with the latter asking her fairy, Why can't we take mom with us? She'll cry without me. Do you love your mom so much? Michelle didn't want to break her daughter's heart very, very much. And she loves me, Angela said trustingly. Okay, Michelle was willing to make this sacrifice for her daughter. Let's go. I'll take you to your mom. But before they could move, Margaret and Kenneth rushed towards them. This is your final warning. Don't you dare. Do you hear me? Don't you dare come near my daughter. Kenneth was ready to tear his ex-wife apart, but suddenly pushed her away and walked off, taking Margaret and Angela with him. Fairy, shouted the girl, but Michelle remained standing in place. She had no more strength for this fight. She returned home and saw her aunt standing amidst the ruins, watching as the men, led by Jason, dismantled the chod boards. Donna, exclaimed Michelle. Michelle, her aunt quickly turned around and enveloped her in her arms. Sweetie, you're alive. Oh my God, you're here. How? Michelle rejoiced. We searched for you everywhere, by address, by name. I have a different name and a different address now. Donna explained, but that doesn't matter now. I saw your photo on the internet and the article, and there were Mike's coordinates. And here you were. Three hours later, Mike approached them. Yes, 
She confirmed with a laugh. How's that for a surprise? Mike asked Michelle. Thank you. She thanked him. Now, with Donna's help, we're going to exhume the buried body before the trial, and you'll be declared missing. In other words, alive. Mike informed her. Excuse me. Still shaken by the scene with her daughter, Margaret stepped aside. The aunt hurried after her. Hard times. Margaret is Kite a character. And Kenneth, well, he's a manual what can you expect? But they're not worth your tears. I don't give a damn about them. Michelle waved her hand. Let them live with Margaret as long as they want. I'm afraid of losing Angela. You won't lose her. The trial is on Friday and Donna began. But Michelle interrupted her. I've already lost her. Michelle confessed. She loves Margaret, calls her mom. And whatever the court decides, I won't be able to tell Angela the truth. It will break her heart. You'll break her heart if you stay silent. The aunt retorted. Isn't Angela worthy of knowing who her mother is? She's a smart girl. She'll understand everything. And Margaret won't love her any less because of it. So, you are going to go now. Wash your face. Wipe away all those tears and get ready to fight for your daughter. Donna had always been like this, sharp and determined. But Michelle exclaimed, surprised that she didn't want to understand her. Are you even listening to me? I won't fight for my daughter. I won't go to court. I won't go anywhere at all. Michelle went to court, and with a heavy heart, she listened to Mike's speech, who said, furthermore, the exhumation results confirm that a male Unidentified body was buried in Michelle Williams' grave. Your Honor, he just did a little hocus pocus. Jason whispered to Donna, who was sitting next to him, and moved the charred remains of a vagabond from the morgue. Here, take a copy. Mike handed the papers to Kenneth and his lawyer. Kenneth just laughed. But that doesn't mean this woman is Michelle. That's precisely why we're asking the court to conduct a DNA testament to compare my client's DNA with that of Angela Young. Mike said calmly, Is anyone listening to me? Kenneth exclaimed, Is anyone listening to me? No one will touch my daughter. No one will touch her. I won't allow it. The judge struck the gavel. Please maintain order in the courtroom. After considering all the circumstances of the case, the court makes a decision to conduct a DNA test by force. Within three days, Kenneth Young must provide genetic samples from his daughter, Angela Young, for comparison with the genetic material of Michelle Williams. The final decision on confirming the identity of Michelle Williams will be made after receiving these results. And there goes our victory. Jason hugged Donna in joy. Great. She smiled back at him. They decided to celebrate in a restaurant. Well, to victory. Mike proclaimed raising his glass to victory. Jason joined him. Sweetheart, aren't you happy? Donna smiled at her niece. Just a little longer, and Angela will be with us. Well, I'll be happy when she's here, Michelle said. And we have another piece of good news, Donna announced. Or rather, Jason does. Come on, tell them. What's there to tell? He said a bit hesitantly. I've been invited to work as a lab assistant at the Institute. To participate in a project similar to mine. Well, that's great. Mike congratulated him. That's what you wanted. Paris. Jason grinned. Paris. Mike was surprised. They somehow found out about my research and called me. Jason explained. And now they're inviting me. Well, what do you think? I'm still thinking. Where should I go at this age? and I don't know anyone there. Well, how can you say you don't know anyone? Donna laughed. You know me, and I've already told you, my house hasn't seen male hands for a long time. Really? Jason inquired. Yes, she playfully looked at him. So many light bulbs not screwed in. Interesting, interesting. Jason blushed. Well, Jason, I'm joking, I'm joking. Donna laughed. Mike's phone rang. Oh, excuse me. He apologized. Yes. When? This is from the police. 
Angela has been kidnapped. In just 10 minutes, they were at Kenneth's place. It was a black Volkswagen van, he told them. Two guys jumped out, grabbed Angela. I couldn't do anything. And of course, you didn't manage to see their faces or the license plate. Right? Mike asked sarcastically. No, Kenneth confirmed. It all happened so fast. Margaret added. We didn't have time to understand anything. Do you suspect anyone? The police officer asked. Me? Kenneth echoed. You know, perhaps, with all this media attention surrounding the trial, someone saw an opportunity for ransom. I don't know. Kenneth shrugged. We've heard that before. Fine. We'll tap your landline and start monitoring your mobile tomorrow. Is that all? Mike seemed surprised. You're just going to take their word for it. And what's your suggestion? The police officer asked. My suggestion? Kenneth said. Find witnesses. How is it possible that a child gets shoved into a car in broad daylight? And no one except the parents sees it. There was no one on the street. Kenneth tried to be persuasive. And, by the way, just for your information, Mike added, the child was kidnapped the day before the DNA test, which was supposed to prove Michelle Williams' maternity. Quite a coincidence. Don't you think? What are you implying? Kenneth snapped. I'm not implying anything. I'm telling you straight. You staged the kidnapping. Are you out of your mind? That's my daughter. Kenneth lunged at Mike. I don't give a damn about your daughter. Mike exclaimed. Another second, and a fight would have broken out. But the police officers intervened, separating the angry men. Break it up. Stop it. That's enough. Despite Mike's persuasiveness, Donna didn't believe him. Kenneth is certainly a scumbag, she said. But even for him, this is too much. I've never seen him so broken. Broken. Mike smirked. Well, of course, why wouldn't he be broken? Ha! Huh. He's about to lose the case and everything he has. Some people can be so despicable. Ha! Huh. Kathy exclaimed. She looked at her daughter, Melissa, stealing children from their own families for money. Michelle listened to everyone, then went outside and found a payphone. Just a minute later, when her ex-husband answered, she spoke calmly and confidently. Hello, Kenneth. Kenneth, it's me. Do you have Angela? Kenneth, the court will still return my name and my property to me. Even if it doesn't acknowledge my maternity. But I don't want anything. Kenneth, I'll leave everything to you. I'll withdraw my statement from the court. I'll disappear from your life forever. I agree. He replied, but I'm asking you, Kenneth, please return Angela to me. Michelle pleaded, in an hour, at the bridge, he said after a short pause, the same one where I proposed to you, remember, let everything end where it began. Will you give her Angela? Margaret asked. He didn't answer her. Margaret worked into the room where the nanny was with the little girl. SHH, SHH, the nanny requested. She didn't eat anything. She was being fussy. Belly got her to sleep. Kept calling for her mom. Thank you. Good night. Margaret thanked her and closed the door behind her. Mom. Angela woke up instantly. Are you here to take me home? No. Honey. I can't take you home. Margaret said sadly. Why not? Mom. The girl didn't understand. Because I'm not. Margaret cut herself off mid-sentence. Your dad and I have already explained everything to you. You'll stay here for a little while, and then we'll all leave together. Okay, okay. The girl agreed. Go to sleep, Margaret requested. Mom, tell me a fairy tale about a fairy. Angela asked. Come here. Margaret lay down next to her. This time I'll tell you the truth, not a fairy tale. You'll grow up soon, and you might not forgive me anyway. But I love you very much. I'm not your real mom. I don't like this fairy tale. Mom. Angela confessed. Your real mom is a fairy. She was sick for a long time. That's why I was here instead. Now she's better. Margaret said through tears. Does that mean I have two moms? The girl asked. Instead of answering. 
Margaret hugged her tightly. Michelle stood on the bridge, and when she saw Kenneth, she realized he had deceived her. Where's Angela? She asked. You'll get your daughter only after I get guarantees, he declared. Then let's continue in court. Michelle snapped. There won't be any court, he said, pressing a gun against her chest. Jump off the bridge. Meanwhile, Margaret put Angela to sleep, then dialed Mike's number and whispered softly, Mike, Michelle's in danger. And Michelle, at that moment, was talking to Kenneth. You can shoot. I won't help you. I'll shoot. Don't doubt it, he threatened. I'll shoot since you didn't die in the fire. So you set the house on fire, she guessed. And the car accident, that was you too, right? She suddenly remembered catching him, Kenneth, with Margaret in the midst of their passionate affair. Margaret noticed her first. Kenneth. Kenneth. What? He instantly understood and chased after his wife. And Michelle was already speeding down the highway in the car, yelling into the phone. I don't want to hear anything. And don't follow me. Stop lying. I'm not blind or stupid. And with her. How could you be with her, my friend? And then, a bright light from the headlights and a terrible crash. Kenneth smirked. Well, think about who stopped you from bleeding out, he said. Who took you to the hospital? Although I should have left you there, in the car, it would have been less trouble. I'm an idiot. Jump. I said jump. He nudged her with the gun. But at that moment, Margaret appeared on the bridge and shouted to him, Kenneth, don't do it. I'm begging you, don't shoot. Why did you come? He was annoyed by her presence. I'm doing this for us. You understand? I'm begging you, Kenneth. Margaret pleaded. She'll take everything. She'll take Angela. He screamed. Don't do it. I'm begging you. Margaret cried. She'll take everything. Kenneth repeated like a broken record. Suddenly appearing Mike lunged at Kenneth, who, in a furious struggle, pulled the trigger, and Margaret screamed in excruciating pain. I'm begging you, Kenneth. Margaret managed to shout, Margaret. Kenneth rushed towards her, Margaret, Margaret. No one understood how it happened, but Kenneth flew over the railing and fell from the bridge onto the hood of someone's car. If he had fallen a meter more, he would have landed on my hood. A startled driver exclaimed, just lucky. Doesn't look like a suicide. Maybe he was just pushed. Meanwhile, Margaret, lying in Michelle's embrace, struggled to speak. I wouldn't have let him do it. I just love him so much. It was me who called Mike to come here. I loved Angela, like a mother. You are her mother. Michelle told her. I told her everything. Margaret confessed. Where's Angela? Just tell me the address. Michelle requested. Rodeo Drive, 44. She knows, knows that you are her real mother. She admitted before losing consciousness. Don't worry, she'll live. Reassured the concerned Michelle by the ambulance doctor, summoned by Mike. Everything will be fine. Police questioned Kenneth's neighbors, who hid his daughter in one of their houses. Do you know who came here? Of course, Kenneth, the neighbor two plots over. So, he's also your neighbor? Yes. Who else? What did he say? He said he had to go on a business trip urgently because his wife fell. But Michelle didn't listen to them. She was looking at her daughter, who approached her and asked, Ferry, are you my mom? Where's Margaret? My mom. We're going to her now. Want to come? Smiled Michelle, holding the girl tightly. 